Welcome to Luba Sports, my friend. Agent Mitchell Luba here. Got him swinging. Trevor Bauer strands. Hey guys, it's Agent Rachel Luba here. Rachel Luba. Welcome back to the second installment of this series where I'm going to take you guys through the off season as if I'm representing a salary arbitration eligible player. I wanted to start by introducing to you my fake player. His name is Mason Saunders. Shout out to my analyst, Jake Zwieback, for coming up with my fake starting pitcher, and he's a first time eligible player. This uh, video basically is going to go through my player, Mason Saunders, his seasons leading up to this point. And I'm gonna kind of analyze how I view his seasons starting from 2018, 2019, and 2020, how they kind of play out in the arbitration world. In the link below, you can download the Excel file to pull up his stats. And so you can kind of follow along if you want to do that. Um, but I'm going to be going off of the stats I have on my computer in front of me. And we're going to look at his career up until this point. Okay, so let's start out with what are some of the most important characteristics of a player's season, things that really help, things that hurt. First of all, the platform year is what we refer to as the most recent season. So 2020 would be their platform season. In salary arbitration, the season that carries the most weight is going to be the platform season. However, your career matters as well. And when we look at that, we look at the length and the consistency of your career. So let's start out with what the CBA lists as the different criteria for salary arbitration and how we evaluate these players. There's six different criteria that we use. The first one is the quality of the player's most recent season, as I just said, the platform season. It is including but not limited to their performance, any special qualities or leadership or any sort of public appeal. The public appeal, the special qualities, things like that don't come into play nearly as much, but it's, it's listed in the CBA. The second one is going to be the length and consistency of their career contribution. We look at trends, trend lines. Are you trending up? Are you trending down? That matters. Trending down is not great. If you start out really great and then you start declining, even if you just fall back to earth and you're like average now, you started off super great, it doesn't look good in arbitration. Then we have the record of the player's past compensation. Now, because Mason Saunders is going to be a first time eligible player, that means that his past compensation would have been this past season and he was on the league minimum. So he was making around $560,000. Uh, so for your first time, past compensation doesn't really play into effect. Unless they unilaterally, there are a few players who unilaterally will get a higher salary. Mookie Betts going to his first year, actually the team unilaterally gave him about I think 900,000 in his platform season. However, that is a rare instance. You know, he was a really great player for Boston. And so they decided to do that. To nail him at third base, what a chuck by Mookie. Except for those cases, uh, most players are basically on the minimum. So we don't really look at past compensation. However, for the second, third time players, this matters. And then we have the fourth one is comparative baseball salaries. And we'll go into that in, in another video. We're gonna look at players from previous years who were also first time starting pitchers and what they got and their performance compared to Mason Saunders, as well as other guys in this current class and what they're gonna get compared to Mason. And then we have uh, the existence of a physical defect or a mental defect. Usually this is really just an injury. If you have that going into the next season, if you're gonna be out for uh, part of the next season or the entire next season, this will have a negative impact on your salary. And the last one we have is the recent uh, performance record of the club. This also includes attendance, things like that. They are used occasionally in cases, but they're not they're not usually that persuasive in terms of attendance. However, if your club did really well, if you were in the postseason, these things are positive. Postseason is very helpful. And again, the performance of your club, because if you, I see a lot of times teams will use this in a hearing, right? They'll say that their 
um, the club has been, you know, in last place in their division for the past three seasons that this pitcher has been on the team. And basically, they will somewhat try to attribute the overall maybe poor performance of all their starting pitchers to being the reason why this club has not succeeded recently. And they will try to say that, you know, your salary should be less because of it. So now that I explained to you guys the basic agreement, uh, the CBA criteria of what we're going to look at, now we're going to go through Mason Saunders' season and I'm going to kind of break it down for you and analyze what I think of it and what it means in the arbitration system. So let's start with his platform season, which was his most recent season. Now you'll see that he pitched 50 innings. So in order to qualify, for the ERA title. Now this is very important for starting pitchers. It distinguishes parts of the market and it separates out players. Players who do not qualify for the ERA title, it's a big knock against them. And usually they are in different parts of the market. You'll have parts of the market that are for players that only qualified maybe once in their career, players that didn't qualify in the platform season, players that qualified in all three seasons or, you know, all four seasons leading up to arbitration. For hitters, the same thing for the batting title, they have to have at least 502 plate appearances in order to qualify. So, if we look at his 2020 season, he has 50 innings. The way they come up with what qualifying for the ERA title is, is you have to have for every team game at least one inning pitched. So that would be 60 innings. He did not qualify. Of the first time starting pitchers, very few actually qualified. It's a lot fewer than would normally qualify in a 162 game season. So regardless, you know, how we want to interpret that or how we want to argue what that means and what the shortened season means on that, that's for another video, but he didn't qualify. That hurts him. You also see that he had a clear regression. If you look at his other two seasons before it, he was a very good starting pitcher. Let's just look at his ERA. He went from being in the high twos, mid high twos, to his platform season having a 4.03 ERA. It's not great for him. Let's look at his FIP. Was his FIP? His FIP was a little better, so that helps. It was clearly his worst season so far, so that's a knock against us for the platform year. However, one of the good things is he didn't have any days on the IL. When you go to a hearing, you're arguing your case in front of labor arbitrators. So they, these aren't baseball people. They're just kind of like your grandma and grandpa. Labor arbitrators have been doing this for a long time, but they deal with labor and employment. One of the biggest attributes they look for is did you show up for work every day? So days on the IL means you did not. You don't want to miss time. You don't want to miss work. And that will distinguish different parts of the market as well. So he had no days on the IL in his platform year. That's great. That helps us. However, again, just a very average, not great season for him. He declined, so he didn't have any awards either. So that doesn't really help us. Now let's look at his platform minus one. We'll write PY minus one. So that would be the 2019 season. Now, if you look at his stats, he didn't qualify again. He just missed it. He had 159 innings, which is a bummer. He actually missed about 30 days on the IL because he was injured. However, let's look at his ERA. His ERA is great. He has a 2.66 ERA. He was elite. He was the cream of the crop amongst starting pitchers. He still had 159 innings. If we look at his advanced stats, they're fantastic. If we look at his R war and his F war, they're great. He was an all-star. Being an all-star is huge. That's a check in the right box for us. And then finally, let's look at his first season, his rookie season, which was in 2018. He qualified. That's great. He had 164 innings. Barely qualified, but he qualified. That's all that matters. So he has qualified before for the ERA title. He had a 2.85 ERA. That's very good too. His war is great. If we look at his awards, they're great too, and they help us a lot. He was rookie of the year. He won that. That's huge. He also got sixth in the Cy Young. 
So now we have, he's a two-time All-Star. He's had Cy Young votes and he's won Rookie of the Year. And this is really helpful for us too, because again, that's gonna be a big distinguisher in the market. That'll separate kind of the elite from the really good guys. So now let's look at his career path and his career as a whole. So he's a full-time starting pitcher. He's never pitched games in relief. That's good. Some guys start out of start out of the bullpen. Some guys split time. Some guys, some guys get demoted. Some guys start as starting pitchers and then they end up in the bullpen. Losing your role, losing your job like that and getting put from being a starting pitcher into the bullpen is, is not great at all. It's better to go from the bullpen to then becoming a starting pitcher, but that even then you look at it and you say, well, he wasn't always a full-time starting pitcher. He started out as a reliever. So he won't be quite, quite up there with the guys that have been a starting pitcher since the day they got called up to the big leagues. He also has a clean career path. And I said I would explain this, but career path matters. So what this means is that if you look at his MLS, his major league service, he has a full year starting from when he first got called up. He got a full year of service. He was in the big leagues. He never got sent down. That's very good. That's helpful for us. What we don't want to see is guys that have, you know, they start, they get called up and then maybe they don't perform well and they get sent back down maybe for a month or two, and then, or maybe for the rest of the season, and then they get called up the next season, maybe for a month or two, and then they get sent back down, or they, you know, get called up for the first two seasons, they're doing great, and let's say maybe in their platform year, they get sent back down to the minors, maybe they get, they get optioned, right? That's a break in your career path, and we want to see a clean career path. We want to see the first time, once you get called up, we want to see from there on, we want to see you're in the big leagues and you don't get optioned. That's helpful for a player. As I mentioned to you guys in the previous video, um, the December 2nd deadline is the non-tender deadline at 8 p.m. Eastern. So that's what we have to look forward to. Leading up to this deadline, again, the 2020 season is going to be weird. There's probably going to be way more non-tenders than there normally are. Um, I believe last year there was around 40 non-tenders. It, it could be, again, a lot more this year. So agents are going to be having conversations with their players. They're going to be talking to teams potentially, considering doing a pre-tender deal, which would be, remember, out of arbitration system. It would be out of system contract. So, and it usually means you're going to take a slight discount than what you would normally get in arbitration in the system. Right now, we're going to be talking to Mason. We've talked to his his team. He is with the Houston Astros. And the Astros have not suggested that they're going to non-tender him. And I'm going to advise Mason that you know, we just hang tight because I don't think he's at a high risk for being non-tendered. And here's kind of some reasons why. First of all, Astros need starting pitching right now. So, you know, they don't have a ton of depth right there where, you know, Mason's going to cost a lot and they can get some guys for, you know, on the minimum for cheaper. And also because Mason's going to be relatively cheap given what he can do. If you look at his performance in 2018, 2019, we saw pretty much full seasons of greatness. And then we saw a decline. However, if you look at his career so far, that 2020 was an outlier, it was an anomaly. And we're gonna hope and probably assume that he's gonna bounce back and we'll get, you know, an more Cy Young caliber seasons out of him. Right now, because his platform season was such a decline, the team's gonna hope to get him at a pretty significant discount given if you took this platform season out and he only had those first two going off of he'd be at the top of the markets because those are two you know elite caliber seasons so because of that the Astros are probably going to look at it like we lucked out his platform year wasn't great so we're going to try to get him at a discount we're going to try to hammer him on the platform year and pay him a lot less and not really have to fully compensate him for the first two years, which were great. The likelihood that they'll non-tender him isn't, isn't too great. So we're not too worried, but on December 2nd, um, we will find out if 
he has been non-tendered. Otherwise, they will have tendered him a contract and we will continue with the arbitration process and he will now be in system. So hopefully that helped you guys understand a little bit of how I would analyze um, a player and his career up until this point through the lens of arbitration. And then in my next videos, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna show you how I would now place Mason Saunders amongst his own peers in the current class. Starting pitchers that are first time eligible this year, where does he fit amongst that class? And then we're also gonna look at look back grids, which are how does he compare to first time starting pitchers in previous seasons? And we wanna to try to get it as most recent as possible. We don't wanna go back, you know, five, 10 years to find a player and his salary that he looks like. Should be unique, again, process because this is such a weird season. Um, in the next video, I'll also extrapolate out kind of what, as if, if it was 162 games, what his season would look like and compared to the other starting first time starting pitchers in his class as well. So stay tuned, make sure to like and subscribe to this video so you do not miss any more episodes. And thanks for tuning in.